Right, let's talk about women in this issue of For All Humans. Being one myself, you can probably imagine I have a few thoughts on the matter. What can we discuss besides the usual roundup of wrongs? Any conversation about women is like any conversation about humanity. No single fact applies to everyone. So some will invariably be left out of the conversation. We'll do our best to include as many voices as possible. And what an incredible array of voices there are. Consider how the voice of a Pakistani child earned her a place on the Taliban's hit list and a bullet in the head. Malala Yousafzai fought no battles, fired no guns and harmed no human being. All she did was speak out for the right to go to school. Consider the voices of Rosa Parks and Viola Desmond, two women who refused to bow to the racist conventions of their cities. Parks declined to give up her seat on the bus to a white man and Desmond insisted on sitting in the main section of a movie theatre instead of the balcony where black people were supposed to sit. Both were arrested for their trouble and Desmond was actually injured in the process. Consider the voices today that are still not heard. 40 million internally displaced peoples, 25.4 million refugees and 3.1 million asylum seekers, most of whom are women and children fleeing violence and certain death, often running headlong into the arms of more violence or starvation. What would these voices say if we bothered to listen? Those voices seldom make it to our ears amidst the noise and clamour of politicians and gunfire. What we have instead are numbers, lots of numbers, lots of big numbers like the ones I just listed. But big numbers are hard to wrap our minds around. And after all, there are so many. We give these statistics sterile names like gender-related killings, so we don't have to think too hard about them. Here's another number. 137 women are killed every day all over the world by a partner or family member. The BBC quotes the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in saying that home is the most likely place for a woman to be killed. This is just a way of saying that nowhere is safe for her, not even home sweet home. Neha Pathanka et al. conducted a review published under the title The Experience of Intimate Partner Violence Among Older Women. The name alone should be enough to make your skin crawl. Their results covered multiple countries, including Albania, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, the USA and Australia. They found that unsurprisingly, older women may have different barriers to seeking support due to ill health or dependency on the perpetrator for care or income. Older women may also be less aware of available support. The voices of these women are seldom held, as they may be silenced by their abusers. Here are some more statistics in place of more voices. Take a research paper called Development of the Human Rights of Women in Cultural Milieu, which is a discourse on the development of human rights of women around the world, particularly in cultural settings in Nigeria. It says, the overwhelming majority of children are deprived of basic education, two thirds of children are not in school, and a similar proportion of illiterate adults are female. What's more, it explains Togo's Ministry of Education prohibits pregnant schoolgirls or students from attending school. Here at For All Humans, we ask you to think about that for a moment. Schoolgirls getting pregnant is a big enough problem that the Ministry of Education steps in. Then rather than addressing the issue of young girls becoming pregnant, their solution was to forbid them to return to school. The Togo Ministry of Education had a chance to listen to the voices of those girls and instead they deliberately turned them away. What's more, the paper found that every state in Africa is a party to at least one international treaty prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex in the enjoyment of human rights or is a party to an international treaty providing for the equal rights of men and women to the enjoyment of all human rights. But these treaties seem to be largely just paying lip service to the concept of human rights as women's human rights continue to be violated daily. And let's not fool ourselves here in believing that the first world countries of the West are shining examples of women's freedoms. Now it is true that while the bar is alarmingly low, it's undeniable women's voices are much more likely to be heard in the West. At least some of them are, sometimes. We'd like to think so anyway. 
According to the 2018 Women in the Workplace study from LeanIn.org and McKinsey and Co, women remain significantly underrepresented, particularly women of color. The study claims that America has made almost no progress in the area of women in the working world since 2015, saying women are dramatically outnumbered in senior leadership. Only about one in five C-suite leaders is a woman, and only one in 25 is a woman of color. The document is full of numbers, so many numbers, all standing in for the voices of women, particularly women of color, who fight every day for the chance to be heard. Here's another number, eight. That's how many extra months per year a black woman in America would have to work to make her wages equal that of a white man's. And if numbers are your thing, that's 66 cents on the dollar in 2017. Here, amongst all these numbers, we raise our girls. A Women's Health Victoria paper tellingly entitled Growing Up Unequal found that over half of girls reported being more valued for their looks than their intelligence or abilities. Amongst repetitions of boys will be boys and comments about locker room talk, that same paper found that many girls are unlikely to understand that violence against women includes more than just physical violence and rape. Into this world we send our young women. Zero Tolerance of Violence Against Women charity surveyed employees working in the private sector in Scotland in 2017. It discovered that one in 10 of the women who responded had experienced physical or mental violence in the workplace, including rape and sexual assault. Is anywhere safe for women? And what does Islam say about all of this? The first words that pop into our minds when talking about Muslim women might include inferior, oppressed and mistreated. And that's because the world sees that in so-called Muslim countries that women are not faring all that well. In fact, under the guise of Sharia law, many countries adopt a pre-Islamic cultural understanding that opens women up to unequal laws and practices. Islam gave women equal footing to their male counterparts. A chapter in the Quran entitled Women, and it's actually chapter four, outlines just some of the many legal rights that were given to protect women. It all lies on the basic premise that both men and women are equal. As God says, O mankind, be dutiful to your Lord who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate of same kind and from them twain has spread a multitude of men and women. Since we're created from one origin, neither can claim superiority. If women are equal in the sight of their creator, it means they should be given equal rights. In terms of education, Islam is clear. The Prophet said, seeking knowledge is compulsory for every Muslim. And again, the Quran says, for we, Allah, had certainly sent unto them a book, the Quran, based on knowledge. Notice that it's not just for men who believe, which explains why women Islamic scholars are prevalent throughout the religion's history, starting with Aisha, Muhammad's wife, the mother of believers. In fact, she was so knowledgeable and respected that it was related by a companion of the Prophet, Abu Musa al-Ashari. We, companions of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, were never presented with a problem to which Aisha did not present a satisfactory solution. Also, did you know that the first academic university was founded by a Muslim woman? Her name was Fatima Al-Firi, and she founded the al karouan University in Fez, which still exists today. Is it important to educate our girls and women? It's a resounding yes, of course. Let me spell it out for you. As an article called Investing in All the People, Educating Women in Developing Countries clearly states, in order to get the best rate of returns on investment and see economic growth in the developing world, funds should be directed towards educating girls and women. This type of funding can reduce environmental pollution, fertility rates and female mortality and help prevent the spread of AIDS. It will also allow women to contribute to economically to their families and as a result, their countries. Conclusion. It seems we're all in favour of education for girls and women. Moving on to the safety of women, and what does Islam say here? Well, there is a clear obligation for Muslims to protect women. The Prophet said to his followers, I urge you to treat women well. He also said, the best amongst you is he who gives the best treatment to his women folk. Let's be perfectly clear here, Islam totally forbids violence against women. No ifs, ands or buts about it. And yes, I hear you yelling at your screens. What about the verse that says you can beat your wife? This saying has come from mistranslation and misrepresentation because it hasn't been analysed within the overall context and framework of the Quran and Hadith. It even starts with saying that men are protectors and maintainers of women. 
Dr. Zainab Alwani, the Islamic scholar and researcher and assistant professor of Islamic studies at the Howard University School of Divinity, addresses this controversial verse in chapter four of the Quran in an article that she wrote called Domestic Violence, Islamic Perspective. What she concluded, as have many scholars and theologians before her, was that the word darba in the verse actually means to separate, to distance. Another interpretation of it is that it's a symbolic tapping with so many restrictions on it, like using something very, very light, like a tissue or a siwak, a wooden toothbrush that can't leave a mark and can't hurt. So in reality, this verse functions to restrict, not permit the use of violence. Domestic abuse is detrimental in so many ways, and that's why it's important to recognize that this is a major global crisis. Here at For All Humans, we believe the cost in terms of reproductive health and physical injury both in the short and long term is huge, and it also undermines the social, psychological, emotional, economical, and spiritual well-being of its victims. Abuse can also lead to depression and suicide, and some health issues can arise well after experiencing the trauma. What's really dangerous about domestic violence is that many forms of verbal and psychological abuse appear relatively harmless at first, but expand and grow more menacing over time, sometimes gradually and subtly. As victims adapt to abusive behaviour, the verbal or psychological tactics can gain a strong foothold in victims' minds, making it difficult for them to recognise the severity of the abuse over time. And anyone heartless enough to think, well, this doesn't affect me, you might care to know that this problem doesn't just affect the victims of abuse. It's also a burden on health and social systems, as well as the nation's economy. The article addressing domestic violence against women an unfinished agenda, addresses the issue of battery in terms of cost to nations due to law enforcement, healthcare and labour lost as the victim's educational and career paths get interrupted. And that leads to poverty and economic dependence, not to mention the cost extending to future generations as an assault by one person in a family reverberates throughout the family and the community in which the children live. Women therefore need to be protected from this as they are the most common victims. So now that we know women are entitled to equal rights and freedoms, what should we do? Here at For All Humans, we believe plainly and simply that we must ensure that all women get the rights that they were given centuries ago. And in order to do that, it's critical for women to be included in the dialogue, Islamic or otherwise, and the many others working hard to correct the inequalities faced by women. We must give women back their voices. If more of us actually stop and listen to the women around the world, perhaps what we'll hear is their screams for overdue justice. We hope you enjoyed this episode, so let us know what you think in the comments section. Meanwhile, share this with your friends and stay tuned for the next one.